the more it's age and stage, churches become more inward focused. They become worried about the long term debt. They become worried about survival rather than thriving. Inward focused rather than outward focused. Churches cease to keep the pedal to the metal. They get sidetracked. For the church of Thessalonica, First Church Thessalonica, I affectionately say, their issue was whether or not Jesus had come or was about to come. The argument being, well, if the second coming is here or almost here, what's the point of really getting too agitated or excited about anything? And so you heard that part in the text about idleness, about folks just not carrying their weight, not doing what their role within the church family would dictate. But Paul's concern is greater than just idleness. It's not just that they weren't busy doing something. It's that they were busy models. And there's a difference of nuance in that Greek and in that translation. To be busy bodies, to be idle is to be kind of neutral. But to be a busy body is to be a troublemaker. To be raising gossip, to be raising negative talk, to be talking derisively. These are those things that the writer couldn't abide in because, again, destination is the glorification of God as it is known within the local church. Or put differently, the word of God cannot run rapidly and be made manifest everywhere unless the love of the Lord is made manifest rapidly everywhere. Starting in the local church starting around our local tables, starting with decisions to choose to be the witness of Christ rather than something else. We're all going to have an opportunity to do that in about the next 10 days or so, because nearly all of us are either going to go around, I mean, travel somewhere to be at table with family and friends for Thanksgiving, or we're going to have family and friends coming in to be around our table. And we have a supreme opportunity to choose very intentionally about how we will witness our core values, how we will witness our fundamental beliefs, how we will glorify God by glorifying love first wherever we are at table. And the reason I say that it's the same reason that we pray earlier. That we have just come off one of the most painful, unprecedented, at points hate-filled election cycles this country has ever seen. And though it was settled on Tuesday, clearly the divisions remain. Sometimes, especially when family gather at table, it's time for some things to crow, to just die and go away. But I would submit that in the name of the one who is love, in the name of the one who we say is Lord over our lives, that we consider that as we gather at table in about 10 days, that with our family and our friends, that we see not Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians. That instead we see Christ in each one of the faces that are sitting around the table. And that that inform our speech. That that inform our thinking. And that inform our expressions of our core beliefs first and foremost. And that we let the other die. That we not be guilty of the busybodiness that Paul is so concerned about in the local church. That we live around our tables in our homes but we seek to live around the table in the church, which is forgiveness, which is reconciliation, which is unconditional love, grace, empathy, coming alongside one another. If the prayers that you lifted up a few minutes ago are to be answered, it will be because we live into invite the spirit of the loving God to infuse our minds, our speech, our actions 
in the next 10 days and the next 10 years, that this be who we are first, Christ once, Christian. And that that be where we put our pedal to the metal, that that be our destination, that that be where we're going to go and we're not going to get sidetracked. I got some tickle a few years ago. I was sitting in Wednesday night at one of those Wednesday night dinners that churches have like, like we have. And it's so much fun to just sit and eat quietly and listen. Because if you listen, people tend to forget you're there. And then they start saying things that they might not really say otherwise and they're really cognizant that you're there. So sometimes, even at six foot three, I can be real quiet, and people will say the most interesting things. Well, shit, Darlene and Charlotte were sitting at table. Now, I have to tell you, Darlene and Charlotte both were 75 plus years old. And I overheard these two begin talking about their driving patterns. And uh, in talking about their driving patterns and their driving experience, Experiences. Uh, and I'm going to skip that first slide that we had, just go on to the second slide, I realized. Yeah. Uh, so Darlene says, you know, when I'm driving Charlotte, and uh, there's somebody behind me that thinks they're going to pass me, they never do. And Charlotte came back and she said, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I got two tickets on the same trip the last time I did that. And our lady said, you know, me too. And the other thing, when I'm driving along and there is some gray headed slow hope ahead of me, I just get around it. And I fell out of my chair laughing, listening to these two 75, 75 plus year old ladies uh, talk about being essentially bats out of hell when they're driving down the road. Pedal 